<clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you, Lloyd, for that uh, introduction. Uh, it's really lovely to to have you um, introduce me and think, and I'm sorry to the effort to count <laughs> the publications and um, and columns and so on. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that. Um, I also want to just take a moment. I know we, we have a particular time to keep, but I want to take a moment um, to take the opportunity to thank um, various people involved in this winter school. We've mentioned these various times during um, the course of the past couple of days, but you know, now that I have the floor, um, I really want to thank Ariana Borongan and Nick Ginto, co-chairs of this winter school for conceiving it, um, for pulling it um, all together, for involving um, various of us, Loy and myself, um, as part of the organizing committee, um, and um, just keeping it going uh, these days. Uh, also want to mention um, so, uh, a few people who actually have been working behind the scenes, Kenichiro Kurusu, Chisato Oda, and Jason Dono Zabala, who, who I think everyone knows because he's giving us lots of instructions um, in the Zoom um, uh, every day. They've been working quietly or, you know, very prominently on, in, the, in the chat, um, doing all this work very, very gladly uh, for the organizing committee and for the chairs um, putting together um, the wonderful flip book of abstracts and bios, which is available on the uh, Migration Linguistics Unit website um, and all the other tech support such that this has been running absolutely smoothly um, and happily. So a very big thank you um, to all of you. And of course, thank you for giving me the space as well to um, contribute a lecture in this inaugural winter school on migration linguistics. I'm, it's, I'm really excited um, to be there and extremely nervous as well. Um, because we've had two amazing days so far um, where we've heard lectures from scholars working in so many different um, disciplines and fields uh, uh, ranging from you know geography and sociology uh, to people working on 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 social justice um, on communication technology um, corpus linguistics um, and so on so uh, we've had so much that we already have had to absorb and take in so many different approaches and so many um, clearly very um, um, inspiring talks I think that has prompted so much um thinking reactions questions ideas for um further research um directions and this has all become evident in the question and answer sessions in the chat um, function and so on now i'm gonna share my screen at this point which hopefully uh, works we've tested it numerous times but here we go. All right. And I trust that you can see my the first slide of my PowerPoint. Um, and so we've had these two days, right, where we've heard from scholars where many of the lectures have focused quite squarely on migrants and migration, including labor migrants, student migrants, non-resident migrants, um, and so on. In my lecture this morning, I'm going to try to push the boundary a little bit, uh, push the envelope a little bit um, on what and how else we can work in this field of migration and language or migration linguistics. And I'm using this metaphor <clears throat> of movement, right? itineraries, um, to think about pathways and trajectories and um, to help us sort of understand or appreciate the you know, nuances of um, movements in Southeast Asia in the early, well, I'm gonna look at monsoon Asia in the early modern period for settlement and for trade. <clears throat> 
to understand the contact dynamics that ensued as, um, as a consequence of these various movements and the corresponding impact on emergent language varieties. And um, I will be looking at two um, thrusts, look first at the agents, what I call the agents. Okay? And in this case, I'll focus on minority communities in Asia who came into being as a consequence of migration. Um, and I will also look at artifacts, okay? cultural words, which have assumed a prominent position in Asian imaginaries and languages. So on the one hand, I mean, so, you know, I said other lectures have talked about <clears throat> migrants uh, uh, as communities and so on. What I'm sort of wanting to look at as a slight difference is um, migration of words in a sense, right? And looking at, um, you know, what we can, what we can um, understand by looking at these movements of words. And in the other um, direction, um, I will also explore, when we look at the agents, I will explore not just migration, but more broadly, this idea of mobility you know, or mobilities, but I'll come to that um, later on. Um, we'll do a deep dive in the sense that I'll use quite detailed case studies or a detailed case study for each of them. Um, so, you know, quite specifically on a particular community, or on a couple of, of, of cultural words, but I hope that our observations um, that are specific to, to the community, to the words, can inform broader questions of mobilities, of language contact and evolution, and so on. All right, so I'm just gonna start the other way around and actually talk about artifacts um, first. All right, here we go. Give me one second to, I'll be back in one second. <laughs> Sorry, I had to close the door so because of some noise that was going on. All right, so we start with looking at artifacts, as I've mentioned. Um, what I mean by artifacts is um, an exploration of cultural words. Okay? This is a term that Tom Hochvost, for example, has um, has talked about in some of his work, and I've just put one reference down at the bottom. Um, which I will return to shortly. So cultural words which have assumed some kind of prominent position in Asian imaginaries and languages. We'll get in examples of this in a moment. So, you know, just as material artifacts, right? Archaeological finds of pottery or jewelry and other kinds of, you know, tangible heritage can provide insights into population movements. So too can intangible ones such as dimensions of language. Okay? And so I hope what we'll see is that when we chart the roots of the transmission of cultural words, this will afford us a more nuanced consideration of the contact between populations and languages. And in this case, where I'm looking, it doesn't have to be this, obviously, um, across the networks of the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea over particular periods of time. And crucially, I think, or what's been interesting uh, uh, that is that what has emerged is something beyond the usual usual identification of the conventional colonizers um, and the con sort of conventional indigenous populations. And I'm talking about this <clears throat> really from the context of world Englishes, where one often, you know, when one um, provides an account, right, for how world Englishes have emerged, one usually talks about the various um, um, settlement colonies, exploitation colonies, the British, you know, being the, the settlers or the, the traders and the local populations and the kind of contact and interaction, uh, which then has brought about, um, you know, new varieties of English. Um, and what I, what I, you know, want to underscore here is that there are other populations, lesser um, explored ones which actually help inform um, our understanding of, of movements and then consequently our understanding of, of the um, evolution of, of um, new varieties. Um, and so as uh, from a method methodological point of view, such a close study of lexical transmission then can offer us <clears throat> 
an approach that helps us reinforce um, our, our understanding and helps us reconstruct sociolinguistic um, trajectories. Okay, so let's get quite concrete with this. Um, and let me ask you, well, I'm not sure if you can put anything in chat function, doesn't matter. Let's have a think about this particular word, shroff. Um, I'm not seeing participants or chat. So I would ask you, you know, how many of you know this word or have it in your repertoire, shroff? You may or may not, it's actually a word that is very closely associated with two varieties. Oh, I do see the chat function. Okay, excellent. Okay, here it is appearing. Chat is enabled. Thank you, Jason. Okay, if anybody wants to say yes or no, or what they know about shroff, please feel free to do that. I'm gonna reveal all in a second. It tends to be, <clears throat> um associated with a couple of um asian varieties of english right so oops here we go if you look at the oed it is in the oed you have shroff and if you just quickly zoom in on the definition it's a banker or money changer in the east right in the far east a native expert shroff is known to me james yes yeah a native expert employed to detect bad coin okay so something to do with banker money changer um let's see oxford says it's a cashier as filipino i don't know this aha all right so thank you jason so as i said it's confined to certain varieties um of um found in of english found in asia you have the banker money changer and you have dun, dun, dun. okay so you see various definitions banker money changer but also something that's associated with southeast asia or east asia slightly incorrect a cashier, especially in a car park, and the image on the right top right hand corner shows you a shroff um, in Hong Kong, right? A shroff office. So it's a cashier's office or payment booth, but especially in a car park, which is really quite a curious one and very, very particular um, uh, to Hong Kong, especially to Hong Kong and Hong Kong English. Um, Nick, never noticed this before. <laughs> All these years in Hong Kong. Um, all right. Um, um, sorry, I like to I like to engage with the chat function when I'm teaching, um, and then I lose my train of thought. We have Wilson Parking, but not sure. Yeah, it's really quite particularly um, a Hong Kong English um, thing. So it's really curious, right? And um, um, where you find it, um, what it means, um, and then we ask ourselves, well, where does this word come from, right? How did it get this way, and why? You know, is it in Indian? <clears throat> and in, in, in East Asia. And it's really, really quite a curious story, but it tells us a story of move, of populations and contact, right? And it takes us all the way back um, to um, Persian Muslim rule and the Mughal empire, okay? So Shroff originally, and you know, I have to, I've realized my time is just, I take a long time to warm up. So my time is going past fast, and this is just the first short part of my talk. Um, so very quickly, Shroff originally, um, etymolog etymologically speaking, originates in Arabic, right? Sharaf, money changer. Okay, and during Persian Muslim rule in the Delhi Sultanate, Sultanate the Mughal Empire, you see the a map on the top left, just to quickly sh show you, you know, the extent of the Mughal Empire. During, during that era, you had large scale Perso um, Arabic influence in the South Asian um, subcontinent, right? So Sharaf from Arabic, <clears throat> and Persian, Sharaf, and, and varieties such as Gujarati, various uh, languages in the South Asian continent as Sharaf. And then you had uh, the European colonizers, right? So during the, the, the occupation of the Portuguese in India from about the mid 16th century, this entered Portuguese. And you can see on the right-hand side, my box on the right-hand side, Portuguese Sharafo, customs officers, or money changes, okay, maintaining the meaning of it. And then, you know, various um, evolution into Sharafajo, Shroffage, and the uh, Sharafas, uh, which is Shroffage is the commission, right, that you get. You, you find this in a lot of historical um, accounts. And then, of course, what's interesting, and we'll see this again in the next word, right, during the um, Portuguese empire in Asia, Indo Portuguese is. Um, widespread lingua franca okay, between the Portuguese and the locals, but not just that, right? But really across the whole um, um, Indian Ocean um, region uh, tended to be used quite a lot, maritime um, Asia, and also because it was so, you know, 
widely used as a lingua franca amongst the locals as well, it was very naturally adopted by subsequent European travelers and colonizers, right? After the Portuguese came the Dutch, after the Dutch came the British, and the British also took on quite a lot of, of um, uh, terminology that happened. Anyway, long story short, what you got was then, you know, originally Arabic into Persian, Gujarati, into Portuguese when Portuguese occupied India, and then, you know, eventually um, emerging as Anglo-Indian English, Sharaf, and then eventually into English as, as Shroff. It continues in Indian English, right, in, in the, the, that very same region, more or less in the same kind of um, meaning. But interestingly, um, you know, in, in, uh, in the East, when the, yeah, even with the, with the British, um, um, during British period in, in Hong Kong and so on, um, and Singapore and so on, Shroff was also um, um, used in Singapore in older times. So it's now sort of um, fallen out of use, um, but it used to also be in places like Singapore and Malaysia. Okay, So during um, British colonial times in all these regions, you still had that term. Uh, and then there was semantic narrowing in a place like Hong Kong, right? So that it became a sort of cashier in a car park. So really curious. So uh, basically the, the idea is, you know, a term, an artifact that seems to characterize, you know, a particular um, variety. Um, if you dig deeper, you'll see uh, a, a rather, um, you know, complex trajectories and, and contexts, which tell us quite a lot about the kinds of movements of people um, over time. All right. Next one here, kanji. Now, when I was putting together the image of this, now this, this is a word that's probably very um, well known to everybody. And I was putting this together, I started getting really hungry, right? If Google kanji, and this is what, get, what you get, right? And it tends to be associated again with East Asian imaginaries. People think kanji, oh, Chinese, Chinese breakfast, typical breakfast. If you Google, you know, mostly it, it, you, what you get is Chinese kanji recipes and lots of images of more Chinese or East Asian type of kanjis. Um, again, in Hong Kong, um, you get kanji houses, right? Very much associated kanji noodle houses in, in Hong Kong or in North America, the big image on the right, bottom right, kanji noodle house, um, if I'm not mistaken, is one in San Francisco, okay? So in North America, uh, I get the term kanji has become associated with East Asia. But again, let's look very quickly and deeply. Um, we'll see that it, you know, this word that's very much associated with a particular East Asian imaginary actually has a complex um, kind of itinerary. Okay, so it's, as we know, okay, it's a dish that's not just confined to that, but around, but it's actually found across wide diversities of, of um, places that actually comprise so-called Asia. And depending on local traditions, it actually can show a diversity of preparations. It can be rice boiled in water, though there are other versions using other grains or legumes or using milk or coconut milk. <clears throat> grains can be long or short, whole or broken. You can serve it plain accompanied with side dishes, or it can be cooked together with ingredients like chicken or preserved egg. On the bottom left-hand corner, you have my favorite baitan okay? <laughs> preserved egg or herbs, etc. And of course, in some, in, in, in the across the languages, there are names for all sorts for all these different varieties, right? In the in the languages themselves. So this is just a small sampling from Southeast Asia. You have Moi, which is Hokkien or Teochew. You have Chok uh, or Thai, and so on and so forth. Um, I know I have quite a nice audience there, so you are going to recognize your Chow in Vietnamese or um, how am I pronouncing this correctly? Luga Lu. Lugao, Tagalog, um, or Kayu. Lugao, <laughs> sorry, the accent there. Thank you very much. Lugao in Tagalog and Okayu in, in, in Japanese, right? So we have all these terms for this dish. Um, and so then the question is, all right, so then if we're thinking about Englishes, world Englishes, and, you know, the term kanji, why kanji, right? Why not all these, why not one of these other terms? As a dish, it was actually documented as far back as the first century BCE um, in East Asia, right? There's early references in the Zhou Dynasty writings and also mentioned um, in the Chinese record of rites. It's a first food served to family members, et cetera, et cetera. Also noted in India, uh, in, um, in 
Pliny the Elder, Roman's um, um, writings in the first century. Okay, so it is documented as a dish both in, in, in these you know, broad regions. And actually, very interestingly, the word kanji comes from Tamil kanji, which means boilings, meaning water in which the rice has been boiled, right? And obviously there are various cognates across various other languages in that region, um, in Telugu and Malayalam, Urdu, and so on, you have, you know, the comparable um, terms, right? Kanji, 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 and so on. And again, a quick look at, you know, how that came, why it is that it's that term, right? From that particular language that evolved into the term that is now recognized as the, the, the world English term for this particular dish rather than any other term for any other language. Again, we look <clears throat> and digging, digging into, you know, the um, movements and context, we see how um, it was again the Portuguese during their uh, time in the Asian world, in particular in India, they were the first Europeans to encounter and adopt the dish. They wrote about it in their medicinal and you know um, economic um, writings or observations of what was going on in India. So, for example, in, um, in this very uh, classic work, um, physician and botanist Garcia de, de Orta referred to the water squeezed out of rice with pepper and cumin, which they call kanje. Okay, so taking on the local word, and then this gets disseminated. So that was one that was probably the first documentation of this dish. Um, there for Europeans, right, to the Europeans, documented by the Euro Europeans. And then this was disseminate, disseminated through the 1600s in other European languages, Latin, Italian, French, and so on. And then event, oh, today, as an aside, you still have that term in, in Portuguese, but it refers very specifically to chicken broth case, a semantic narrowing again for that particular word in Portuguese. And that's just an aside. So anyway, Portuguese and various Romance languages, and then eventually into English as well, documentation again of, you know, what's going on in India, but certainly, you know, um, going along the same path as what had already been documented by the first Europeans there, right? The Portuguese and the other um, um, writers. Um, another, um, the translation, uh, in, in another early documentation in English would be a translation from the German translation of the original Italian of the voyage to the East Indies, another classic work um, by Paulino de San Bartolomeo um, and his observations in India, which does describe kanji boiled rice water, which the Europeans call kanji, right? So originally written in Italian, but then translated. So that term just gets adopted. Okay, so very, you know, fascinating um, pathways of how, um, you know, where a particular word comes from, um, which tells us really tells us a lot about, you know, historical roots, um, language contact, and so on. Okay. Somebody's written to say Filipino restaurants use kanji rather than other Filipino words. So that's really interesting, right? How kanji then, you know, so then the question is, you know, um, 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 comparing, sorry, let me just go back, right? If we look at um, um, the term kanji and then the Tagalog word lugao, okay? And then the question is, you know, how, how is that distinguished now? Are they going to stand for slightly different things or different um, types of, um, of uh, kanji? Or is kanji really more Chinese version? And then lugao uh, is, anyway, it's interesting to see how these, these will distinguish themselves. But I mean, the point here really now is, uh, you know, how just looking at, at um, words like these really can tell us quite a lot. This is just an image from a translation of um, one of these writings. Okay, down on the left, the left bottom, um, corner lines, you can see the translation, Orta says, this is like an interview, and Orta says, they give the patients water to drink with pepper and cumin seed, which they call kanje. Okay, so you have an example there. Okay, so I really need to move on very quickly. So <clears throat> such culture words are recognized as good indicators of language contact, being more transmitted more easily than basic vocabulary, because obviously they represent something, you know, that's cultural uh, artifact. Um, characteristic of a particular um, 
culture or community or place. And um, as I've already been saying, right, a consideration of the roots of the transmission gives us a more nuanced con consideration of the context of communities and languages, in particular in the trade centers. And of course, here I'm talking about the Indian Ocean. And of course, we can look at many other regions. And as I've, I said at the start, right, crucially, it gives us an insight into what's going on in terms of contact and movements beyond the usual, usual groups that we look at of English speaking indigenous people. And this really substantiates our historical understanding of cultural contact okay, and gives us an appreciation of the kinds of, I like to you know, talk about entangled itineraries okay, that we see um, when we're thinking about migration and movements. I wrote, I've written this up recently um, in, uh, in a chapter for a forthcoming um, collection. Now, I mentioned Tom Hogevost's work um, earlier, and uh, he goes a little bit, up, he goes further to talk about you know, particular subaltern groups, right? So we're thinking about loan words, usually, um, you know, historiography studies tend to feature the powerful people, right? The kings, the merchants, the conquerors, and so on, and the language they used and the people that they interacted with. And Holgerverse talks about people on the margins, right? People on ships, in harbors, in shops, kitchens, brothels, prisons, um, who may not have left anything behind except one crucial thing, language. Okay, in his work, in, in that particular work, you know, he really looks at the language of sailors and all the words that got transmitted um, and moved around between the different ports, um, the, cook, the tailors, the cooks, right? All the names for of food, which also travels around and so on. And so this is one interesting area, as he suggests as well, um, he talks about Indian Ocean studies, but you know, depending on what, whatever you're interested in, the lives of such subaltern groups, right? So that it's certainly something that one can think about and explore, um, depending on what's relevant to the area or the field that you're looking at. Okay, now uh, let me move on. Um, let me take a sip. That was meant to be the short warm up, and now we're getting to the meaty stuff. We go into the second area um, that I want to talk to you about the agents, right? And as I mentioned, you know, we're looking at minority, well, I'm, I happen to be looking at minority communities in Asia who came into being as a consequence of migration, and we're interested in their mobilities within ecology and the impact on contact dynamics and language evolution. Now, I've already used the word mobilities a few times, so I mentioned it at the start, and so let's go into why I'm doing this. Okay, what now? This is a winter school on migration linguistics. So I'm just being a little bit provocative um, here uh, to sort of just not to criticize obviously all the amazing scholarship that goes on in migration studies. And we've heard so much of this in the past two days. But also to, as, as I say, to sort of just push the envelope, right? To sort of explore what else there is or how, how else we can think of, of this idea of migration. Now, broadly speaking, we have at, at its core, when we think of migration, human movement across an international border within a state, away from a habitual place of residence, various motivations. Okay, I mean, that's in a nutshell. And we've already heard so much about how to think about and how to frame migrants and migration. Now, crit crit critics um, of migration studies have identified various limiting dimensions, and these actually have been highlighted in the various talks that we have heard in the past couple of days, right? The fact that um, certain kinds of identification tend to be privileged, right, which sort of um, puts people into categories, very static categories, ethnicity, nationality. Um, so, you know, these can be to uh, sedentary, you have this idea of um, the issue of migrant exceptionalism, where there tends to be focus on, um, on, on migrants or labor migrants, a bias towards lower skilled migrants as an object of interest. You have negative connotations um, where with, you know, the idea of movements, migrants, um, you know, needing to move because of, you know, uh, less than positive um, circumstances. So of course, as we've seen, as Brenda Yo, for example, mentioned, you know, in recent um, um, scholarly gatherings, um, there have been a, a plethora of new terms, right? And new ways of thinking about um, um, different types of, of, 
um, migrants, right, or talented migrants, and we've seen also students, et cetera, et cetera, of course. But this, this has been the, criti the critique that has arisen over you know, the, um, the past years, right? So you have also, just to continue my bullet points, new and other migration types, which have not in the past been considered, but certainly scholarship is certainly, you know, um, paying attention to that um, in recent years. And most importantly, the fact that the dynamic nature of human mobility is simply not fully captured. Okay, so these are people who work in in kind of mo new mobility studies, um, making it a little bit distinct from migration studies. So there's, of course, a huge amount of overlap, but there are certain um, dimensions of the paradigm, I think, that these scholars just want to highlight. Okay, and I just want to um, put this out there as something for us to think about, yeah, as to whether this offers us a different way of thinking about or looking at um, and um, you know, evaluating the situations that we're studying. Okay, so let's continue. So recent decades have seen a turn, and this is in the social sciences, right, to the new mobilities paradigm. And I put various um, references down at the bottom, okay, so that in case you're interested, you can sort of go and explore these further. Human mobility is viewed as entailing complex assemblage of movement, um, social imaginaries and experience, right? Not just the physical or the geographical movement. And in linguistics, we had, have seen quite a lot of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary perspectives that have been brought to bear on the examination of language and human mobility, especially in today's globalized world. Um, um, the handbook of um, um, language and, and migration, right? Um, that um, migration and language that Suresh Karnagaraja um, has edited, and which various of our colleagues have um, have contributed to, of course, is a very good example of lots of work that has looked at um, migration in this broadest um, perspective or a diversity of perspectives. Um, and other work has looked at not just geographical mobility, but also, you know, trying to um, couch or frame what's going on in terms of sociolinguistic, social or symbolic um, mobility. And one approach that has been quite interesting is looking at mobility as capital, where this conceptualizes the capacity of entities um, goods, information, etc., to be mobile in social and geographical space, or the ways that entities access and appropriate the capacity for social spatial mobility according to their circumstances. Okay, and there are three interrelated factors basically access, so what kind of access act actors have to different types and degrees of mobility, and this is linked to opportunities and constraints shaped by the structural conditions in which they are embedded and their social location. The second one is skills, so being mobile requires put certain kinds of skills and other capital to organize the movements, carry them out. And then the third is appropriation, right? The appropriation of opportunities to realize projects, okay? the ways in which agents interpret or act upon perceived or real access of skills so that they can actually, in reality, transform mobility into kind of capital. All right, so I mean, these are, you know, ways or factors that we can look at when we're thinking about particular communities or particular situations. Um, and so I'll leave that for now. You can you know, sort of have that in the back of your mind. Um, when we look at the community that we're gonna take a deep, quick, deep dive into um, now. Okay, and that's the, that we're gonna take ourselves to um, Singapore, which you've heard a little bit about in Brenda Yeo's uh, talk. I'm not going to go into the details of Singapore here, not so relevant for today's talk. Um, simply that, you know, we, we I'm sure most people in the audience are reasonably familiar with the fact that um, just very quickly in modern day Singapore, obviously it was acquired by the Brit British East India Company, became part of the Strait Settlements together with Penang and Malacca. Um, and then self saw self-government uh, in 59, and then became part of the Federation of Malaysia in 1963 to 65, and in 65 gained independence, okay, but certainly a former British colony, and obviously that has implications for the kind of um, language um, um, strata that you find in Singapore, okay, with English obviously having a very dominant role. All right, 
that's where, all I'll say for now because there's not not enough time. But if anyone needs clarification, you know, put it in the chat function, or or we can talk about it later. So very quickly, as I say, what I'm going to do now in the next few slides if you, is give you a quick whistle stop tour, whistle stop tour of the Peranakans in Singapore um, to give you a, a sense for you know their origins, but also their positioning within the ecology and over time okay so we sort of see sort of two or three different eras <coughs> there will be a lot of detail a lot of socio-historical socio um, um, detail because that's I feel is very important for understanding um, you know their their excess and appropriation right when we think about the factors of mobility um, how they actually took advantage of of um, what was available to them. Okay, so um, let me just look at the time. All right, we'll make it. <laughs> so in the between the 16th to 18th century, what you had was southern what seafaring traders, merchants, etc., from the southern Chinese provinces, the coastal provinces of China, um, heading towards Southeast Asia, um, essentially settling, um, find, you know, finding good trade in places like Malacca and Penang. These are on um, various parts of the coast of um, Peninsula Malaysia and Singapore. And these southern Chinese males, male traders, merchants, etc., cetera, um, eventually or quickly settled um, with local women who could be Balinese or Bata or Javanese. Sorry, not only in Peninsula Malaysia and Singapore, but also in um, the, the Indonesian archipelago as we know it today. Um, and their descendants and, um, you know, had developed or evolved a very hybrid kind of culture and existence. Uh, you see the quote there in the middle of the slide, the settlers, whenever it is in their power, form connections with the native women of the country, hence has arisen a mixed race, numerous in the older settlements known to the Malays under the name of Paranakan China. Okay, so Paranakan essentially um, from Malay, meaning uh, born here, uh, China, um, you know, Chinese Paranakans, as it were, because of the ethnicity of the males, right? And various other names are used or term, uh, uh, terms, Peranakan Chinese, Babas and Nyonyas. Babas tend to refer to the males, Nyonyas to the females, and the Nyonya is used adjectivally to refer to Nyonya outfits or cuisine and so on. We also talk about the straits born Chinese, okay, so the Chinese who are born um, in the territories of the Straits of Malacca and the Straits of uh, Singapore, okay, so that particular um, area. So they were the earliest, some of the earliest Chinese immigrants, and they tended to settle rather than do a return migration. Um, so they were more permanent, and because they were more permanent, they built themselves to be really more um, prestigious, as we'll see in the next few slides. Okay? And they distinguished themselves from later Chinese immigrants, right? They would refer to the later ones, even though they originally came from um, the coastal provinces of China, they, they would refer to the later immigrants as Singye, new guests, right? So they were the early, older settled, older migrants. So what emerged was, and again, very quickly, you know, a very um, distinct cuisine, um, distinct outfit. Okay, so what you see in the image there on the left is a very traditional outfit of a sarong with a kabaya top, okay, a kind of blouse, which has European influences as well. Um, but this has, you know, evolved to more, more, more modern versions, okay, which we'll see later on. Um, the Peranakans lost touch with China in every respect. They continue to uphold Chinese customs and religious practices. Okay? And obviously, from a language point of view, what we're interested in is Baba Malay, um, which was um, uh, a, a variety of Malay, which had which showed lots of um, sinity, especially Southern Chinese um, influences, okay? especially Hokkien or Min. Um, I won't go into this in great detail, but just very quickly in the box at the bottom, you just see a very quick, um, you know, um, um, characteristic difference. Okay, on the right hand side, you see what is pretty much the Malay that's um, um, 
uh, found in Malaysia, Indonesia, you have something like bilik saya, um, room, first person singular, right? So uh, in that order, which means my room, whereas in Baba Malay, you would have something like gua punya bilik. Um, gua is first person singular, um, but from Hokkien, yeah, Hokkien pronominal system was taken over into um, Baba Malay. And then uh, word order is also with, uh, you know, um, pronoun and then possess possessive marker and then um, the noun, okay, for my room. So just as a very quick example of some differences in Baba Malay. Um, so you had individuals of mixed origin, which and you see this pattern happening in many other parts of the world and with, with many other Creole communities, right? They often ended up um, um, finding a place as middlemen, as merchants, as interpreters, right? Because they straddled different cultures and variety of languages. As mentioned earlier, because they were early in the region, they managed to set themselves up, economically speaking, um, uh, very much involved in, in agriculture and in mining and trade and so on. And they were recognized um, as being a more enlightened, better merchants, a better class of Chinese in Singapore. All, they also, and this is quite crucial actually, held a high regard for English medium education. They had the opportunity to, and they took the opportunity to send their children, including the girls, which was really rare during that time, to English medium schools. This was the early 19th century. This, they themselves were so established um, that they could, they could themselves establish educational institutions for um, you know, local people, not just um, for the English. Um, and um, they partook of things like the Queen's Scholarship, they, uh, which sent them for uh, education in high institutions in Britain, which then produced scholars and leaders who then returned and took you know, prominent positions. Okay, so um, just as an aside, right? And now I'm giving you quite a lot of historical detail and it's a really nice sort of story and narrative, but, um, you know, just constantly think of this issue of mobility as capital and how the community is constantly sort of identifying um, um, opportunities and sort of appropriating them. All right. Um, they aligned themselves so much um, with the, British because they had, they had the opportunity to. They had social clubs to which they would admit no um, person from China. They played billiards, bowls, other European games, drink brandy and soda ad libitum. On asked if being on being asked if they were Chinamen, they would bristle up and say in an offended tone, "I'm not a Chinaman. I'm a British subject." Um, they formed the Straits Chinese British Association which changed its name over the time, and now it's the Peranakan Association. And its aim was to promote trade and foster loyalty to the British Empire. Um, the language of the association is English. The first volumes of, 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 the, of the magazine, which they've been producing regularly, was in English. Okay, so again, you know, let's just take ourselves back to, you know, their beginnings. Yeah, they happened, you know, their beginnings, not unlike many others, traders, merchants, you know, came into a particular region, but then starting to take up um, opportunity of that access of being early, of intermarriage, right, of settling, and then, you know, one thing leads to another, right, so in terms of access and appropriation, you see how they have um, done this. Okay, so let's look at first, you know, one of the um, uh, outcomes, right, or uh, effects of, of their mobility. Um, what, what, what do we see? as an outcome of their various choices and actions, right? And so one of them is we see an effect on their, the community's repertoire and the heritage language, okay? So from the time from where originally they had evolved, developed a Baba Malay vernacular, and that's still identified as the heritage language of um, the Peranakan communities in Singapore and in, its, in, in the other locations. Um, so that evolved then in the early days of the, the formation of the community. And then because of their um, timing and positioning, they also acquired English and they spoke it tolerably well. Because of um, because their repertoire included English, this allowed them a predominance in commercial se sectors because the repertoire also included Malay, Hokkien, Chinese, various Chinese languages, and of course, a knowledge of the local ways, this afforded them a position, right, a significant role as intermediaries between the Europeans, locals, and Asian newcomers. 
But because also their repertoire included English and, and the, the fact that they aligned themselves continuously with the British, this in line with um, politics of Singapore in, you know, leading up to and at Singapore's independence, which really had English as quite an, as a very important or the primary language um, in Singapore, um, you, what you see it, or what we saw is that there was a gradual shift to English, right, and greater um, affinity to um, and embracing of um, British practices and the English language. And as a result of that, what you get is the endangerment of the heritage language, right? So we can sort of understand this or frame this as an outcome of the various choices made, the various mobility choices that were made by this particular group. Um, I'm not going to play this, um, but I'm just going to quickly just flash this up, up for you. Uh, have a quick look. Okay, so there's just one example of Peranakan English or the English that they speak, or at least one <clears throat> variety of the English that the Peranakan community speaks. Um, what's in black shows fairly acrolectal features, fairly, you know, seen as standard English. What's in green shows you um, more vernacular features, either depending on how you want to approach this, mixing with Baba Malay, or if you, you want to look at Pranakan English as a kind of trans-languaging trans whole, a trans-languaging practice. We're not going to get into that in this particular um, lecture, but the interesting thing really is to see that there are elements of both the language that has been shifted to, but also the vernacular language um, um, having a very uh, clear presence there, yeah, through terms, through... Um, um, phonological features as well. All right, sorry, I have to do this really fast because of time. Um, in written um, English, and this is based on um, newsletters published in the Pranakan or by the Pranakan Association, uh, you see it, as I said, primarily in English, but lots and lots of terms um, from Baba Malay for cultural practices, food, naming and address practices, etc. Um, in you know, encompassed in the English. We'll come back to this observation uh, towards the end of the of the lecture. Okay, so the next um, um, point uh, I want to look at is the effect of mobility. Um, point two: um, Not only does is there an effect on the community itself and its heritage language, but there is also an effect on in this case, we're looking at world Englishes on the emergent Singapore English within the ecology um, in which the Paranakans were a prominent um, player or prominent agent. Okay, so you see effect on, on something bigger. And here's a very, very quick example. Um, let me do this uh, fast and hopefully clearly. <clears throat> now, We'll look at one dimension of Singapore English, all right? We're going to look at um, prominence, okay? Word prominence uh, or phrase prominence in terms of where, you know, simply put where a particular accent is placed, okay? Or where a particular, which syllable is particularly stressed. Now, if we look at most contact languages around the world, Nigerian English, for example, uh, various uh, various creoles, but we won't go into that today, or even second language acquisition varieties like Chinese English, um, those which have tone language substrates, okay, so that it means that the other languages in the mix, uh, there's at least one, if not more, which is a tone language okay, and carries lexical tone. And when you, when you um, look at examples of such contact languages and look at the emergent English, you'll find that there's a high tone Okay, so the tonal dimension uh, comes into the emergent English and there's usually a kind of high tone and a low tone. And the high tone tends to be matched to the syllable in English that tends to have lexical stress okay, or the accented syllable. So for example, in the left-hand box you see in Hong Kong English, for example, if you have a word like intend, okay, so I'm just doing it in a very standard English um, non-tonal <laughs> contact variety, uh, intend, and you see where the stress is, right? Origin, 
photograph, okay? Stress on all, stress on full, um, original location. So we hear where the stress patterns are. And in Hong Kong English, you get high tones associated with that stress syllable. So in Hong Kong English, it'll be something like intent, origin, photograph, original, no, that's better, original, that's a better rendition, location, okay, location, low, high, low, okay? something along those lines. So you get high tones and accented syllables. In contrast, Singapore English does something quite different from all these other contact um, language varieties. Okay? So with a sim similar sorts of, of words, you do get prominence, but the prominence is always word or phrase final um, prominent. Okay? So the high tone, as it were, is always find, found at the, at the right edge okay? towards the end. So intend, around, origin, and so on, you get intend uh, or origin, bilingual. That's my uh, switching on my Singapore English accent now original security okay so you've got this prominence at the end originally and so on and so forth okay so let's go on to see why this is the case and this is a very quick and dirty um account of it <clears throat> which uses the ecology paradigm so salikoko mufwene talking about language ecology and um one dimension of his paradigm speaks of um um a founder population okay or founder populations in ecology founder populations being um the populations that were the earlier ones in a particular ecology and the idea is that they tended to exert a strong influence on features and this influence persists in the emergent variety okay so what's interesting and just very very quickly um, with what was going on in Singapore English, because the Pranakan as, as a community were the early ones, if you remember, they were also early English adopters. They were some of the early ones to acquire English. They were also in positions, lots of people in civil service, um, as teachers, et cetera, et cetera. So they were in positions to disseminate an English variety. And so what you find is that they were the ones, they can be seen as a founder population whose um, variety of English or, and whose features actually influences or influenced the emergency Singapore English variety because, so not just the socio-historical um, circumstances, but if you look at their heritage language, right? So if you look at their vernacular, Baba Malay, like many other in Malay Indonesian varieties, you, you do in fact find word stress uh, or phrase final prominence, okay, on the word stress on the penultimate or final syllable or end phrase final prominence, so right edge prominence, exactly as what you see with Singapore English, okay, so, um, so what you find is that this most, this is hypothesized to have be in the Peranakan English features, and it's actually has been identified in Baba Malay in Peranakan English, and thus this explains why Singapore English has that curious characteristic pattern of prominence towards the ends of words and phrases in contrast with all the other contact language varieties which tend to have prominence on you know the accented syllable all right so loy i realize it is past 10 I'll you have probably... yes so um can i go on a it's up to bit... you i'm just gonna How go long... on a tiny bit more i'll be a bit okay all right sorry. and then yes. sorry okay, okay. So the story doesn't end, okay? So very quickly, there's a little bit more, but I'll flash it quite fast. Um, <clears throat> at that point, so no, so so far we've looked at, you know, what has happened up to about the emergence of Singapore English, up to about um, the previous um, millennium, end of the previous millennium, okay? And what's interesting is you, we, if you recall, we saw a shift from, um, the vernacular to English, but what we also saw, and this is the top quote there, was that there was this um, ultra conservative mode. Again, okay? this was observed later on. Um, later on, various members sort of noted this. There was um, a self-imposed exclusivity, ultra conservative mode. You know, painted itself. The the community painted itself in a corner, trying to maintain this true blue Peranakan mold, okay, who can speak Baba Malay uh, and English. But second, the second quote there, these, you know, uh, were really recognized to be part of a vanishing breed, okay? And so um, um, 
the community itself, as well as various scholars, and started noting that the community was either already a vanished breed, as dead as the dodo, you know, and uh, certainly dying out. Okay, so what happened next? And we're still thinking about mobility, right? And it and and vitality and evolution, and we see that. When we entered the new millennium, something there was this whole change within the Peranakan community. Now, this really had to do with a change of leadership within the community, and you know, new people came on as you know, as executive committee and so on, and rethought what it meant to be a Peranakan. All right, and so effects of mobility. Um, we look at the continuing trajectory in the new millennium. Okay, and this takes a few different forms. Again, I'll just go through this really quickly, I hope. One, um, post-vernacularity, okay? Post-vernacularity is a situation where language serves the purpose of identity building within the community, even after it ceased to be a vernacular. So it's no longer vernacular, by no means is used by the Peranakan community as an everyday, um, 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 in their everyday repertoire. But you had documentation um, as di in dictionaries and in, in guidebooks and so on. Um, you have, you know, symbolic performances, church services, um, um, theater, theater plays every year, really just for the theater. Um, of course, you have the usual revitalization, reinvention, youth groups, um, use in rap and hip hop. And fortunately, as I said, because the leadership was different, they had a lot of connections with um, important people in the government and they managed to um, acquire quite a lot of funding to set up a Peranakan museum and restore a traditional Baba house, where, um, you know, living quarters. Okay, so these all were happening in the first decade of the new millennium. But this went on, okay, so beyond post-vernacularity where it wasn't just about maintaining or using um, the vernacular in sim for symbolic purposes or in symbolic domains, but what was seen was an increase in cultural vitality. Right? Be, um, the community was going beyond the use of the vernacular for symbolic purposes, but actually performing, practicing their language, or what, you, what you might call the language shift variety. So, um, productions were um, Chinese, um, sorry, there was a comedy series produced for the for the local television, also a drama series in Chinese, um, Peranakan artifacts uh, in, you know, um, uh, the Paris Muse Musée du Quai Branly, um, you had um, Peranakan storytelling uh, in English, and Peranakan songs no longer composed in Baba Malay, but in English and used to showcase Singapore. Okay, so what we started seeing was that a community was no longer constrained by this ideology of purity, right, compared to the desire for being true blue in the past. And instead, where are we? Okay, so and on you know online now, I'll just go past this really fast, and you can see very clearly there was a there's a presence online. And it's all in English, okay? The Facebook pages of the Pranakan community, even the, the Facebook page, which was supposed to be about chatting in, um, in the Patoa was also in English. Um, have a quick, well, let me go, go past these ones. These are just about the different communities, okay? And finally, what you see is commodification and branding. So Pranakan culture, because of its increased prominence and its... Um, use of its emergent variety, English, to gain better access to mainstream, Pranakan culture started being embraced, right, and adopted by the mainstream, mainstream Singapore, and actually used as a multicultural emblem of Singapore's social mix. So Pranakan culture actually has been styled as Singaporean culture. Again, you can see, you know, outfits and so on. I'm wearing one modern kind of halter top in sort of Pranakan theme and so on, um, all representing Singapore. So very, very quickly then to tie it up, you know, what we see is that the Pranakans leverage, so going back to ideas of mobility and so on, they leverage their early arrival and permanence and maximize their potential for spatial social mobility on the dimensions of access to different forms of mobility. They were competent enough to recognize English would be, you know, a route because of the British and, you know, what, what that affords them both during colonial times as well as in post-colonial times, right? And they made use of such access and appropriated these. As I say, crucially, they were able to do this on 
uh, across different eras and changing ecologies, and this had effects on their own repertoire, certainly, also on the emerging Singapore English, but also on their, in a, in a way, a positive um, way on their own positioning and their cultural vitality within the wider ecology. Now, I do have things to say about how we can um, rethink shift and what shift means. We can, you know, see contact language formation as a part of the birth death process. And, um, or, and we can see shift as a kind of multilingual realignment. I think these thoughts actually came up also in um, um, James McClellan's uh, talk yesterday, right, about the, um, the choices within a multilingual repertoire. Okay, and I just point to the last point there, the bottom, right, evolution to new language practices affords the multicultural periphery some kind of repositioning for greater accessibility to and participation in the center, increased inclusion of the other and better adaptation to survive and thrive in a changing ecology. I'm so aware that this really, you know, rubs up against um, more traditional views, right, about how to manage language shift and how to manage maintenance and revitalization, or what to do about heritage languages. I know this has come up a lot um, in our various discussions in the past um, couple of days. Um, and this is a particular situation for a particular community who was in a particular position in Singapore. But I think it certainly, um, you know, gives us interesting things to think about in terms of what it means, right? What language shift means, what adaptation um, means. And, you know, um, just leave you with some last views from the community itself, who has now really looked at Peranakanas as an evolving living culture. Um, you know, champions and fans, everybody can be involved. And this is um, a letter from the president just at the end of last year, who talks about letting go, who talks about reimagining and reinventing, who talks about organic evolution. So it's really interesting to actually see this also from the community um, itself. All right, sorry, I'll stop now so that there's a few moments um, for a little bit of discussion. Apologies, I promised you I would go 